Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. I almost said barf. Was, it was oh, almost rolled off right away. <laughs> we got Chad in the house. Chad, how we doing? Good, good. How are you? Good, man. Any fishing lately? No. I uh, I have a repetitive motion injury in my shoulder Uh-oh. from throwing a nine weight rod at stripers. It's like Ben Roethlisberger. He's <laughs> not going to be playing for the rest yeah. of the season with an elbow injury. Yeah. I, I tend to get a little OCD on stuff, so I been striper fishing a lot and my shoulders like now it's kinked up so bad i'm getting like headaches ouch and it's been like this for like 10 days so i just took the weekend off feels a little bit better today but it's a high quality problem (laughs) and we'll work through it (laughs) so uh without further ado i want to introduce our our guest uh today we've got jose setka is that right that is correct is that right yes he's the manager of the fish and wildlife at east bay mud on the mccollamy down there right Correct, correct. Is it involved any other waterways, or is it the McCollumy specific? Yeah, it's primarily the McCollumy River. It's where the East Bay Municipal Utility District gets its water from. So mm-hmm. we have Party and Comanche Reservoirs. Our aqueduct is set up to feed out of Party Reservoir, and downstream of that is Comanche Reservoir, which, which provides the environmental flows, flood control, and use for downstream irrigation districts. Gotcha. And so this is not a government agency. Correct. This this is a local government agency, oh, so okay. it provides water to the East Bay cities like Oakland, Berkeley, Walnut okay. Creek, about 1.4 million customers. So is it kind of like um, Sac's got, Sacramento has their SMUD? Is that right? Correct. So okay. the Municipal Utilities District Act, which I don't want to okay. bore your uh, <laughs> listeners with. Bottom line, no, we do it all the time. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> um, but bottom line, there's districts that were formed under that originally. SMUD okay. is oh, one of those. Okay. Um, okay. East Bay Mud is another, and there's okay. a few others in a d- in the state. Okay. And it just so happens your jurisdiction, there's one there. Correct. Okay. Got it. How many million acre feet is that up in those? holding ponds um the capacity is about 650 to 700 okay community and parties thousand acre feet yeah and let's talk about acre feet visually because i'd love to talk about acre feet visually (laughs) so here's the analogy i use tell me if it's it's right or wrong so picture a football field and then picture a football field filled with water one foot deep you got that is one foot acre foot of water that's just one acre foot of water and correct. you have six hundred thousand of those stacked up right exactly and there's how many feet in a mile Nick? <laughs> <laughs> why are you coming to there's me there's like 52 something yeah i, I don't gonna know say it's five, so 5, think of that fifty two hundred <laughs> feet divided into six hundred thousand oh, that's a damn tall building that's a very tall building absolutely yeah. so it's a shit ton of water is what it's I'm a shit to ton of water and <laughs> i think you know the media probably has a list of different um calculations that they use whether it's basketballs footballs i don't know cats yeah. whatever yeah. stacked at some level to come up with acre feet another of water. good one i saw <laughs> was uh when you're talking about cubic feet per second is imagining like a, th- a thousand chickens coming out of this tube you know like it <laughs> per second <laughs> i was yep. like huh. that's funny <laughs> yep. i'm pretty f- i'm a fan of, of spatchcocked whole chicken so <laughs> that, that, that really does hit home with me well jose we're, we're obviously here to talk about the success of um, the mccollamy fish hatchery it's been all over the news um you guys have done a, a fantastic job especially in, in full-on drought conditions um so, so we want to before we get into the details of that can you just tell us a little bit about yourself and and how you got started with East Bay? Sure. Um, so I went to University of California, Davis, um, graduated in fisheries and wildlife biology. Uh, prior to that, I was in the Army, and so I used the GI Bill. I'll give a plug to the GI Bill to, go. Uh, to go to college. And then I pretty much straight out of college started working for a consultant that was working on the McCullumy River doing work for East Bay Mud. And just slowly but surely worked on that, got hired on, did a few other jobs, worked for the... Uh, feds on um, some work up on uh, Clear Lake, not the Clear Lake on the foothills, but the Clear Lake in New- Northeast California. Okay. okay. I didn't know um, there was two of them. There is two of them, yeah. Um, but you started out on the government side or, and then and then moved to com- consulting and then moved to the, to the SMUD? Cool. To East Bay Mud, yep. Okay. Yep. And then basically once at East Bay Mud, just started as a technician and kind of worked my way up the chain. So. Wow. Nice. So, and now you're, you're managing the whole fish and wildlife piece of the McCullumy right. the branch. Ma- yeah, manager of fisheries and wildlife. And basically we have not only the McCullumy, which is where all the salmon work goes on and some of the key stuff, but we also have about 38,000 acre feet or 30,000 acres in the East Bay. 
that we manage also. That's where our terminal reservoirs are. Is that That Delta? doesn't have salmon. No, that's actually no. San Pablo Reservoir, Lafayette Reservoir. Um, those are the ones that are open to the public for fishing, and there's a few others that are up in the hills there. So when we take that water from the McCullamy, we store it in that, those terminal reservoirs. And those, that's where the, we feed. Why, why is the term terminal used in, in that context? It, it's basically a tank. Okay. You know, you just, instead of a steel tank, it's, a, it's an actual reservoir. Okay. And right. then, so I, I saw a, a, it sounds like there's something similar in, in Los Angeles. They have their the Los Angeles Reservoir. Correct. And I saw like a documentary where they had these balls, like these plastic balls on the top, and it was to m- basically mitigate evaporation so that they don't lose water. Do you did you guys ever mess around with that? Do you think it's horse shit or um, does it work? Our reservoirs are so big, it, just it, it, it would not. I mean, right. the amount of plastic okay. balls you would need to cover <laughs> our reservoir is not, it's yeah, not a good okay. way. Okay. But you know, open reservoirs that that is an issue. They're not very efficient at keeping water, and right. there's a lot of evaporation, just like open canals. Right. If you're going to ship water, you know, 600 miles in an open canal, you're going to get a lot of loss through evaporation and seepage. So, okay, something to think about, but. Okay. I haven't thought about the canal piece of that. I thought that the, the those plastic balls are kind of ludicrous when you see those things getting dumped into yeah, the river. That's like, really like, weird to see too. But I think it was successful in, in yeah, keeping it, the it evaporation. It did yeah. a really right? good job. Yep. So it's it's they're they're effective, but you it's it really comes down to the size of the reservoir. Right. It has to be feasible. Yeah. Absolutely. Economically, I think that they paid like a twenty cents per ball or something crazy, but I forget. I'm probably wrong. <laughs> Just count on me being wrong. So, so what was the fishery or um, hatchery like when you when you were a technician and you started back then? So, when I started working on the McClellan River in the early '90s, they had just come off the drought of the late '80s, early '90s. There had been a number of fish kills in the hatchery. The system was operated a lot differently then than compared to it is today. The flows were set up primarily to benefit water supply. The consideration of the environment was minimal at that time. So we were in the beginnings of a switch over to a more uh, environmentally friendly, friendly way of operating. And there were lawsuits and, and many things that pushed us to do that or in that direction. So that's when I kind of came on in like 92 and 93 and then finally started working for the district in 95. So the district was like, we need somebody with a biology background. Well, they had people. I was just they, I was just right. a working dude. I was okay, a technician okay. when I yeah, first yeah. started. I wasn't their savior. But <laughs> <laughs> but they started to build a team and you know, how they approached it was a little bit different. Some folks like to districts like to just pay consultants to do everything. Mm-hmm. And that's the when they started that way. But as they started to recognize the benefits of, you know, doing the right thing, operating the right way. Just starting from a brand, the brand perspective. Exact, too, yeah. Exactly. So they, they started to see, well, maybe we do want to have actually biologists on staff. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's crazy for an engineering you know, company, but they made that. And what we have now is just you know, an incredible team that we put together. Start out with zero, and I have 15 people. And then are they division. all biologists? They're technicians and biologists. Okay. Yeah. And then are, are they all fisheries people or? Nope, fisheries and wildlife. So okay. we also have responsibility for actual watershed lands. Okay. So deal cool. with ESA species, like things like red-legged frogs, tiger salamanders. Mm-hmm. Where do you where do you recruit most of your talent out of? Um, most of it comes from, you know, local universities. Um, any, fr- any Davis? Do we have another Davis? I don't know. We only have me from Davis, actually. Oh, damn. <laughs> <laughs> they seem to be everywhere. Yeah, well, San Francisco great, State, you know, um, Humboldt. A lot okay. of folks from Humboldt, cool. a few from Berkeley. Cool. Yeah. So how did the, the culture and the, and the goals change in that, in that time period? So basically, after the lawsuits and after those initial fish skills, you know, we had to come, number one, we had to come up with an agreement, what's called a FERC agreement. So FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Committee, mm-hmm. very powerful tool to use uh, on multiple sides but it really for ngo non-governmental organization environmental groups to use to make changes in operation so we went through a FERC process and after a decade of <laughs> negotiations came up with a joint settlement that included the u.s fish and wildlife service and california department and fish and game at the time now wildlife 
signed off in that agreement. And that agreement has a whole slew of things, but mainly it's flow and non-flow components. Flows were based on very, uh, water year type, where you're talking about a critically dry year up to a wet year. And so depending on the time of the year, what you have in a river from a salmon perspective, you had minimum flows. And then on the non-flow side, you know, all kinds of things. One of them was a $13 million rebuild of the McCullumy Hatchery, which is one of the keys to the successes there. Mm -hmm. And then also um, habitat restoration, just the commitment to restoring spawning gravels. And now we're transitioning into the, kind of the floodplain work too. So that's adding yeah, cool. adding rock and debris and places right. for those fish to hide, basically, and spawn. And spawn exactly because what a lot of folks don't realize is when you put a dam up, not only you stopping water, you're stopping sediment. Mm -hmm. So no longer do you have that sediment, that gravel flow going through the river. So after a number of years, there's no spawning gravel left. I've only seen pictures of of the Mokolomi down there and and it reminds me a lot of uh, just a small feather river right i mean but, and you look at it and it, a lot of the same characteristics and ba because of what you just said absolutely um, yeah it's it's a mini feather mm. no doubt about it huh. very interesting um you know our annual um runoff average is about seven hundred and fifty thousand acre feet you look at some of these other reservoirs in, or um rivers in the in the central valley you're talking million and a half two million acre feet of annual average runoff right right so um what was next after that agreement so after that agreement we had to start implementing and implementing means two things we had to start hiring staff to do that but it also means funding and funding is key and it also means that one other thing that our board so we have a publicly elected board um so another thing they did was create a mission statement, and that mission statement put stewardship of natural resources on par with water supply for our customers. Huh, that's and that was key, and that's key for a number of reasons. One, it allows us to justify the funding requests that right. we made. Well, it's and a measurable thing, too. Absolutely. You know, um, you know we have um, targets that we try to meet every year as mm -hmm. a district as part of a strategic plan, and one of those is salmon returns. So on par with, you know, uh, generating power or providing water supply or making sure that we're treating it correctly is making sure that we're getting the number of salmon in the river that we should be. Um, so those were all kind of in the beginning wrapped into helping the district make that commitment to improving conditions in a river. And after that, it was just also a collaborative effort working not only with the agencies, but with universities in science, because in the beginning we didn't really have all the um, information the and all that you know, know that that background to make some of these projects work. So we involved groups like UC Davis to come in and say, "Hey, we have this river, you know, work with us. What do we need to do?" And that's when we started. Because before, for instance, a, a spawning gravel project would involve taking a front loader and just building a berm across the river, and that we called spawning restoration. Well, <laughs> it did work. I mean, salmon did spawn on that. But you need complexity. You need something that's going to hold up. You need something that's going to be functional as the river flows move that gravel downstream. Mm -hmm. You want all that to maintain function as best you can. So that's where the university came in and helped us design some of those initial projects. And as they were doing that, we were learning. And then over the course of time, we just started to do it ourselves. Okay. So you started out with outside consultants until the, you got the training wheels off, essentially, right? Exactly. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way of putting it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. That stewardship part sounds huge, too, just from a mission statement point, right? It, it absolutely is. To have a, a water district, especially at that time, you know, late 80s, early 90s, make that commitment, um, really was something that you did not see right yeah i mean i I'm, I'm a firm believer like you know i worked at ebay for a lot a lot of years and i this was pounded into me at ebay but um you know an, an employee someone boots on the ground they're when when they go out and, and do their job if they're not if it if the mission statement and and the and the objectives of the mission statement that shunt off of it don't somehow roll back to how they're compensated right then the train the fall the wheels fall off the train so to speak so the fact that you guys put that mission statement in it trickles down through all the different projects it's always there it's like a steady drum beat all the way through the process is that 
accurate. And that's accurate. And, and it's also backed up by the funding because that's one of the key issues if you look up and down the valley is the commitment to long-term sustained funding. Yeah. R- it, whether you're talking about monitoring, whether you're talking about habitat restoration or research, y- it's very difficult to do that if you're only going to do it in chunks of two years. And then at the end of the two years, you don't know if you're going to have yeah. funding. Um, or you get a gap. Okay, well, you know, we got funding for two years. We had to skip a year. Oh, now we got funding. So we got to you know, crank it back up again. Uh, yeah, research and monitoring don't work well with that kind of funding model. So there's no money for recovered salmon, but there's plenty of money for recovery of salmon. What do you think of that statement? No money for recovered salmon. That, that could be true, yeah. Because they're dead? No, because they're back, you know? So, I mean, if you have the salmon there, wh- where's the money gonna come from, right? If there's no recovery efforts that are, that are needed. It was something that James Stone had mentioned to me in it. In it. Uh, and James. Do you know James? I do know James. And it, it just made a, it made a lot of sense, you know, yeah. is that kind of what you're, yeah. And, you know, for him too, you know, and up here in particular, you know, you have winter run, spring run, fall run, right. and there's always it's that very complex complexity. And you know, your regs for fall run are based on what's happening with winter run. And then all the money goes into protecting the winter run and trying to bring them back. And there's a cost and that means the money's not going elsewhere. So interesting. Yeah. Um, and talk about, uh, I'm just thinking uh, you might have a, something you're about to say, Chad, but I was thinking about the, the moving or just the simple thing of moving the gravel around uh, as a restoration project. Um, what, what did you guys learn from, from that project that was different? So a couple things, number one, you know, moving the gravel around. So we had to get gravel from another source and bring it to the river. So I remember the first time going to a quarry next to McCullamy and say, Hey, we want to buy the gravel. So, okay, cool. What are you going to do with it? We're just going to dump it up in the river. (laughs) What? (laughs) Well, I mean, when the river, you know, on dam back in the, you know, someday where there are much bigger flows, that used to be part of the river. Yeah, you're the river. We're just putting gravel back. Bringing it back. (laughs) Yeah. It's Um, been on loan. So some of the things we learned, I mean, you have to put it in a certain way. You're looking at depths, you're looking at um, velocities, um, you're looking at both not only providing spawning habitat, what needs to be a certain depth, certain velocity, but also looking at provide things like cover, whether you're adding woody debris, adding boulders, putting pockets in between the gravel berms, just so salmon have a place to rest as they're spawning. Mm -hmm. Um, And they're also looking for juvenile habitat. Um, Another piece of it, when we're doing the work, another thing that goes on with restoration is a lot of folks, projects get built, but they don't get monitored afterwards. So they don't, you don't get that performance measure out of it. So we worked not only with the university, but amongst ourselves, and we actually took that monitoring and actually saw how the gravel was performing, both in terms of what's spawning there, but also looking at inner gravel uh, conditions, because part of the things are the eggs going in the gravel and then get buried there in those little interstitial spaces. Mm -hmm. So you have to make sure there's flow through the gravel, you have to make sure the temperature's right, you have to make sure the dissolved oxygen's right within the gravel. So we've done all that. We've done all those measures and kind of just proven the effectiveness and performance of our restoration that it does indeed work. Um, other thing on collaboration and transparency is getting that information out there because a lot of times agencies do work and they keep it within internal reports. They're not necessarily hoarding it, but they just don't get it out there. A lot of money was spent uh, doing exactly. it. Exactly. So not only working with the universities, we, we invited uh, students to come in and do their master's or Ph.D. projects on our river, on whatever projects they wanted to work on. We published in peer-reviewed journals, um, which is not an easy thing to do. It takes a lot of time. But the payoff for our program to do that is, the transparency in getting others outside of our group to say, yeah, you're right. it's working. To come on board, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Huh. It makes me think, you know, I look at the feather and the high flow, and, and I just going to, you mentioned boulders. I mean, it, it's just flat, you know. The, the high water has kind of flattened everything out, and there's really no structure in there for any type of fish to hold. A bush, a, a rock, something that would just keep. Right now, we have a problem of all the fish moving past the the high flow and into the low, and just boogieing through all that spawning area. They're just moving right through it and not utilizing it. Um, it sounds like that's something that might 
that might work or, or be needed in that situation. Yeah, no, adding complexity. And one of the things with salmon in particular, you know, they want to keep moving upstream. Right. And there's got to be something pretty good to make them stop <laughs> and consider spawning before they get to the top. So sometimes it might be something like, you know, you might have to put some weir or something to block them or slow them down to get them to start spawning because their drive is to go as far up as they can. Right. So. Right. Hmm. So they just kind of go until they can't go any further. It's not like a temperature thing for them or is it a combination of both? What's well, a combination of both? They, they have to have some good cues that are driving them to go up where they're going. So if you got a bunch of warm water coming out, you know, it's going to delay them, but salmon ultimately got to have to spawn once they come into the system. So ultimately they will move up. They just won't be successful. And something that's unique to your system is, you know, when you guys get those fish, uh, you'll get what's needed to, to create your quota for spawning these fish and then basically shut the gates, right? Correct. Where most of the other hatcheries out there, they just keep the fish coming through. Yeah. It, you know, it depends on which one, but the generally they'll keep the gates open longer until they just don't have space to deal with the number of fish that are in there. Right. On the McCullough, if we kept our gates open, we could take 80, 90% of the run which wow. just doesn't make sense. I mean, <laughs> right. we, ha- we want to have stuff spawning out in the river. Um, another thing we do that's been pretty unique and we've been pretty effective at is m- um, managing temperatures during the fall when the fish are in the system. Um, during the drought, that was a, a big challenge. So we have two reservoirs. We have Comanche, which is a very broad but shallow reservoir. doesn't do well at keeping Still cold water. water yeah. Pardee is a very narrow reservoir, but very deep. So when the drought came, it was challenging to set that up to where come October we would have good water, cold water. Were you guys like mixing? Uh, Basically what we did is we held off releasing uh, water from Pardee. We forego generation. So in a drought, it's hot. People are calling for power. We made the commitment. No, we can't generate. We need to hold on that water until October and start feeding Comanche and feeding Lower River. So where other systems had significant temperature issues, and I'm sure up here you heard about, you know, Shasta and mm-hmm. some of the fish kill issues. Um, on the McCullumy, we actually had fish from the American River trout hatchery that were moved to the McCullumy over the summer of 2015. Conditions because they knew that in American, you know, things were going to get really bad. Um, so we were able to kind of survive that based on the research and studies we had done, in this case, dealing with reservoir and reservoir management to maximize the cold water available during that fall so, period. So just so I'm clear, um, you guys basically said, we're not going to generate hydropower. We need to keep some water in reserve so we could pull out the bottom of the dam. Um, I assume it's during a peak usage time, right? It's during the summer. Um, there's definitely still a need for the electricity. So how did you guys, did you, did you just buy it from a different area and, well, and route it over or how did that work? So we we're so we don't use the gener or the power that we generate. Oh, we just put okay. it on the grid. Okay. So it doesn't it. go to East Bay Mud, uh, right. doesn't okay. go to our customers. It just gets put on the grid. Got it. So we have options in terms of when we do that. Okay. Um, and kind of, it's interesting compare that to a year, like let's say 2017 where everything was full, there was water everywhere. You have to pay sometimes to put water on the grid if the grid's already full, which boggles the mind. I don't mm-hmm. quite get that, but that's the way it works. It, did you mention pulse flows in that? No, no. So another thing that we've done and we've done since 2009, so most you probably remember that in 2008 was the big Central Valley stock collapse. McCullumy River, where typically we were seeing thousands of fish come back. Um, in 2008, I think we had 412 fish come back, um, which is just, you know, unheard of since we had, you know, brought on and done all these good things in a river. So we kind of stepped back and said, okay, well, we need to reevaluate what else can we do to improve returns to the river and come back from this collapse as quickly as possible. One of them was the pulse flows that we we theorize that if we could put down these attraction flows in the fall, that we can pull more of our fish up into the McCullumy and have less of our fish stray to other systems. Because in 2008, one of the issues was that of all the McCullumy fish coming back to the Central Valley, 75% of them went somewhere else. They didn't come to the McCullumy. Most of them ended up in the American River. Hmm. 
And you know that because of the tags that were exactly so that were right. Yep, code of wire tags. Before, um, before we, I've got more questions sure. around pulse flows, but for the newer listeners, we're we're adding people daily now. So for the new listeners that don't know what a, a pulse flow is, and its relationship with you said an attraction flow, can you kind of, can you explain what those are and what the uh, it's a tool in your toolkit. So can you guys explain? Sure, absolutely. So salmon salmon move on cues. <laughs> when they're out in the ocean, it can be the angle of the sunlight. As they start to approach the bay and maybe the mouth of a trib, they start to pick up maybe some of those scents. But they also rely on other things to change that actually says, okay, maybe now it's time for me to go. One of them is flow. So if you can change the magnitude of flow coming out of a tributary, that might cue the salmon that are kind of milling around and waiting to go. They see that. And if you can happen to hit that also with some sort of rain event or even just a low barometric pressure event coming through, boom, there you got them, and they'll, they'll move. So it's like the green, you're at stopped at the green uh, red light, and <laughs> the light turns green. It's, right? it's and actually traffic starts going. It's happening as we speak right now. Right now. There are salmon yeah. staging outside of the Smith River, for example, and they're, when they, they get just the slightest taste of that pulse of flow or the rains come even if there's not even a push of water it seems like those fish will hydroplane right into right into the river and, to, and to we start see this, this process on the, on the coast when we're steel steel heading yeah right yeah. yeah and just right now this first rain that's coming to the coast you, you see a lot of, not just smith a lot of these rivers you'll start to see a lot more fish pulse in right and so this year and we've lucked out we started our first first pulse flow today and it just happened to coincide with this little band of rain that came through so interesting we'll see we'll we'll see yeah Yeah, i never um i never heard of anyone coordinating the barometric pressure just you know rainfall with an actual release that's absolutely that's cool i'm sure it happens all the time but it's the first i've heard of it it happens and if you just look at escapement numbers when fish are moving past whatever device you might be using to count them you'll see that not only in rainstorms but even when you have these big wind events there's no clouds but just that change in pressure will push or cue some fish to move um and in our case, we haven't talked about it, but the way we count the salmon. So many rivers, they do estimates based on how many fish have spawned, or they do what's called a carcass survey where mm-hmm. they go out and count the dead fish and come up with an mm-hmm. extrapolation to come up with an estimate. On our river, there's an irrigation dam downstream in Lodi. It's called Woodbridge Irrigation District, and there's a dam there. And in that dam, there's a ladder, and we have a video system set up. So when the salmon are coming in, there's no other way for the salmon to get past that dam other than to go up that ladder and pass that video. So we can count every single salmon that comes into the system. So we have pretty good counts on what's coming in, what goes to the hatchery, what remains out in the river spawning. What if the river's turbid? Um, it's, we can still count. It'd have to get really turbid. I'm mm-hmm. not saying it hasn't in times. If it's a really bad storm mm-hmm. with a lot of surface runoff, we might lose the video for a couple days, mm. but we'll, we'll get it's it back. Pretty regulated, quick. so it stays fairly clear. So we, yeah, and I mean, and they're only coming through like a, okay, you know, a fairly relatively small opening, three feet. Yeah. So. And we've been talking about uh, utilizing pulse flows for upstream migration, but let's talk about downstream. The smolts sure. coming through and predation. How the the relationship between a pulse flow, the smolts coming down, um, predation, all this other stuff. Right. So the downstream movement of fish, first of all, you know, upstream salmon are moving up. You know they're moving up. They're not stopping. They're going. Juvenile fish outbound have different strategies. So you have the fry, small fish. Some of those go out right away, especially in these bigger winter events. They get caught up they in that flow. Surf. They just surf it out. Yeah. It'd be great if there's all these floodplains out in the in the delta that they can hang out with. That's one of the issues of today that there's not that much habitat out there. So they have nowhere to go. But then there's those fish that kind of hang out and stay in the river until they smolt up. And smolting means they transition from living in fresh water to going out to the ocean and living in salt water. So that's a physiological process that happens at a certain time of year, usually kind of April, May-ish mm-hmm. for fall run. And then they go. So you can't just pulse water to force them to do something. So when you're using water in the spring, a piece of it, absolutely, especially towards that latter half when you start to get into April and early May, you can use them to move a bit. But what you're trying to do is create habitat. So on the case of the McCullough, what we're working towards is you flood up that floodplain habitat, and not only does that provide 
cover and shelter for some of the fish. The water's a little bit warmer. They can move in there. They can grow a little bit faster. It also provides a lot of food production, which is what the fish are you know, also looking for. So whether the fish goes in there or not isn't necessarily a key thing, but the food production coming off those floodplains right. into the river right. can be huge. We saw that in a, in a project with um, Cal Trout and UC Davis on the Yolo Bypass. They were basically raising these hatchery salmon in the, in the rice fields, and they just did a screen testing. They threw a bag out and pulled it through the water a couple times, and they had a bag from the river and a bag from the rice. It looked like a cheesecloth. Yeah. With a, it, with a it was amazing to see the amount of food in the, in the rice, and after only being flooded for a couple of weeks. You know? yeah. And then you have the main river coming down with very little food in it. This sums up exactly what you're talking exactly, about. Exactly, yeah. No, and and you know, the fish grow big, and they grow big quick. Quick, yeah. yeah. I know, and going back to what you said about 08 and those fish kind of being, being lost, right? You had a small number coming in, the, they were kind of straying elsewhere. The same thing happened uh, here locally. On I the can't feather, right? on the, I can't remember the year. It's uh, actually the Sacramento where sorry. they they truck the fish all the way down to the Verona, you know, further south there. And then three years later, there was salmon showing up in ditches in Walnut Creek and around that. I've never seen so many fish caught on fly in the Delta. <laughs> there was just pictures of salmon being caught left and right on a fly. I'm like, what the heck is going on? But yeah. all those fish were straight. They, they didn't they know didn't where to get go. Their imprint is they, that right? Is that the issue? Right. So Let's talk about that. So. You know, that's one of the balances. So you have a situation where you have survival versus, you know, fish coming back to the system and being available for, in that case, it was primarily commercial fisheries and recreational fisheries out in the ocean. But you truck fish, they lose that imprint. They survive better. You see more of them. You catch more of them possibly out in the ocean fisheries. But when they come back, especially in the Sacramento, because you know, the upper stack is so far away, Yep. from the delta and they lost all that imprinting that they get very few returns from those truck fish where our our river is right next to the delta we truck them a very short distance just to get through that central delta which is a death zone for <laughs> juvenile fish um it's the so thunderdome yeah exactly <laughs> and they always lose um so if you can get them past that we get tremendous survival you get tre- uh, survival to the fisheries for folks to get them and our stray rates are generally less than, a, let's say, if we trucked them all the way out to San Francisco yeah. Bay. Uh, with, with respect to stray rates, is it are they still spawning? It's just not they're they're spawning in their natal. River. Exactly, they're not, the they're not spawning in their natal streams. Okay. Um, there are there there are folks, uh, you know, a house of thought that think that each river needs to have its own stock that's that was my next adapted question. to the system. Which there there's some positive to that. There are others that feel a Central Valley fall run salmon is a Central Valley fall run salmon, no matter where it goes. Right. And, and that's true, too, from a genetic perspective. We've, so. been impl- we've done that since 1800s, exactly. right? We've been exactly. manipulating yeah. that for a long time. So people are like, are, are there still wild fish right. out there? Or? And generally, you know, an upper stack fish is going to come in earlier and is going to move up quicker. And they're not going to end up in the McCollum because in the McCollum in the September, we really don't have big flows coming out Mm -hmm. um so they kind of do it their own way but there are things that go on in the delta Uh, one of the things you know we've been working with since the the stock collapse is the delta cross channels that's those channels down there by walnut grove where when they're open they take sac river water and kind of run it through the central delta uh, to improve water quality but also to move that water down south to the pumps well, if, when they're doing that in the fall, that's a big queue of water. I mean, you're talking about 1,500, 2,000 acre f- or CFS of water going through those gates. So if you're a McCullamy fish that needs to make a right turn and all you have coming out of McCullamy is 100 CFS, you're going to go where you're going to go is. with the flow initially. And then once you're through it, you may realize you made a wrong turn, but by that point, it's too late. So it's manipulations mm. with those that if we can get those closed, during certain times of the year for extended periods, our stray rate, our fish going to other systems actually goes down. And that's something you guys did? You communicated with? Yeah, working with the Bureau, working with uh, DFW. Our best year was the year, I believe it was 2017. That was when the first uh, fish from the trucked upper sack fish were going to come back. So they figured if they closed those channels, it would also improve their returns back up to Sacramento because they wouldn't have that queue 
mm-hmm. to head towards the central how, delta. But how, um, you know, from like a, a hardware and software perspective when it comes to gate control and flow control and stuff like this and, and then interagency and inner, even if it's a private, private uh, companies, how connected from a, you know, ops perspective is it? Do you understand what I'm saying? I do. Absolutely. Okay. So, you know, in California, there's two big projects. There's a Central Valley project, which is a federal project. Mm-hmm. Shasta, uh, Folsom are the key reservoirs mm-hmm. for that. And then there's state project. Uh, Feather, um, D- uh, Department of Water Resources, is the big reservoir for mm-hmm. that. So they coordinate because they're, it's their responsibility to maintain delta conditions and outflows at certain levels. So they coordinate pretty well. These smaller systems, like the McCullumy, don't have a formal roll at that table or seat at that table but since 08 recognizing that if we don't coordinate better in operations our outcomes aren't going to be that good we we've certainly been at that table and you know particularly at times like this when the fish are moving up try and communicate better in terms of how we time our pulses Mm -hmm. so in our case for instance we try to get our first pulse which is happening this week out ahead of the stanislaus um, because that way we think, and at least one year it's shown, that if we can get our pulse out earlier, more of our fish will come our way than in the Stanislaus. Because so. that comes in bef- basically first, right? The Stanislaus, is that right? Is it? it kind of, yeah. It's th- We're kind of east side tribs in a way. Yeah. Um, so we're... It's a little trickier than that. Right. So for the McCullough. I, I picture kind of like all, you know, at every every major watershed where there's it's a managed system which is 90 percent of them in the valley in california um it's like you got to figure out when your your fish are coming back tell everybody else to kind of like not do any pulse flows i'm gonna (laughs) i'm gonna push them you know i'm gonna pee into the delta and hopefully they'll come up on on this uh this wave that that's that's what we're doing it's trying to time those pulses now you know there's also yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I mean, there's also things like that you have to get rid of water. Like for in our case, you know, our reservoirs are relatively full for this time of year, and we have to get into a flood control mode, which means we need to make space. Right. So there's only so much time you can wait before you say, okay, we got to get rid of this water and make our space. So when, how often do you guys meet um, strategically, you know, across all the different watersheds? Do you guys ever go to a retreat and, and like, you know, hatch out a scheme for that year or, or how does that process work where you guys all coordinate or is it more just everybody's got each other's cell phones and you just kind of, I think it's more on a cell phone side. Yeah. yeah. So we, you know, internally we have weekly meetings, right, we have weekly right. operations meetings right. where we go through everything. Um, we might attend like a Stanislaus operating group, um, at this time of year, just to understand what their plans are for the year. Yeah. Um, there's also what's called a CalFed operating group, which is actually the feds and states going together. We have folks that attend that meeting just to kind of, you know, be there to just listen to see what they're going to be presenting. Um, but in terms of coordinating operations, right now that doesn't exist. Um, I think moving forward, Seems like it should. there are some, you know, not to get too far into weeds, but right now what's being hotly debated is a uh, the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan update. In the news, you may have heard about voluntary agreements. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's all, almost all the water users within the Central Valley are working to come up with a flow and non-flow plan that would involve, to some degree, coordinating operations to meet certain outcomes like delta outflow or improving mm-hmm. um, habitat within the delta. That makes sense. Something new. Um, Is that, that going to take ten years to? To implement or it could it could right it, it, you know it depends on what goes on i mean there was a recent piece of legislation that really raised some hackles on both sides um that was called sb1 and it w- looked like if that passed a lot of folks were going to walk away from the table which would have led to a 10-year what, what was it again i forget i think in general it's called the trump protection bill i mean for lack of a better term it's it it was it's designed to maintain environmental protections as they were before uh, the recent administration got elected got it okay um so okay um where was i gonna go with that um did you guys ever were you barging fish down 
downriver? Yes, we did a three-year pilot program where we used a, um, it was a shrimp fishing boat. So people think Bubba barge. Gump shrimp? It basically, it looked like <laughs> that. Um, it wasn't a purpose-built craft, so it wasn't ideally designed to do that work, but we wanted just to test it and see, you know, does it have promise? So it was a three-year pilot project, uh, project and it, it worked. I mean, the survival of those fish far outweighed what was moving down the river naturally or what was put in net pens at uh, Sherman Island. Um, so, And by doing that, you kept the imprinting intact. and Right, so we just ran the, ran the pumps through there, pumped that water through evaded there. Evaded the, the predators. The yeah, exactly. so explain the difference between the barge and the, a, a, a truck. Obviously, I mean, one's on the land and one's on right. the water, but what's the what's the kind of like theory around keeping the thing, bar, the, the fish barged up? Right, so in a truck, obviously, they load them up at the hatchery, use the supply of water there at the hatchery, drive them, whatever, 100 miles, um, and plant them. So they've had no imprinting. They haven't been able to smell or taste that water as they're moving down. We put them in a barge. We can recirculate that water from the, out, from the river into their tanks as they're going downstream. And, and the theory is that that will certainly help them imprint so when they come back, they will have that cue, that that smell, the cue off of, and and find their appropriate stream. And you had those fish marked, and saw them come directly back to the begin to the. Yeah, so we had them we had them tagged yep. with the wire tag. So yep. when they return, you know, we could extract that tag and find out, you know, where they were or what group how, they were from. How bad do you think the predation is in that area f- for all those fish? It is, is it, it is as bad as you can imagine. So basically, our naturally produced fish. The survival of those was well, well, well below five percent, moving out, probably below one percent. Right. So we just, which is a number I've heard yeah. from biologists, you know, basically throughout the valley, normally. Right. Now and the central delta is even worse. So you have the delta, uh-huh. but let's say you have the Sac River component of that. You have the San Joaquin, then you have that central portion where the east side tributaries drain into. That that's the worst. So the management of the system in regards to fisheries is to keep fish from going into the central delta. The McCullamy flows into the central delta. We don't get that option. Um, so between habitat, between uh, predation, and also just the flows and, and just uh, you know movement of water, it's just so confusing that even though the, they're not necessarily getting tra- entrained, that means that our fish aren't necessarily getting sucked down to the pumps. But that movement of water is confusing enough for them that they spend more time there. And the longer they spend there, the more odds that they're going to be uh, someone else's meal. What's the main culprit predation-wise? Yeah, everybody talks about stripers, stripers, stripers. Stripers, I think, are a fish that congregate at certain hot spots, whether it's built below a, a dam. Let's say it's near a bridge abutment. Um, and they're very well seen. So when, you know, when a striper hits something versus a bluegill, Everybody sees stripers, but it's all of them. I mean, we got largemouth bass, we got spotted, we got uh, red eye. I mean, there's just a Hard whole head. litany of non-native um, centra- or centrarchids and bass that are yeah. in there that it's not just one. Yeah, we, uh, we recently had a guy on that um, spearfishes striper. Oh. And he's killed a lot of them. So, he, you know, he pulls, he looks, at, he's also an angler, so he looks at the stomach contents. Yeah. And, you know, he, he ranked. You know, I'm not going to say what was in the stomach the most, but he ranked at the very, very bottom of that striper list of stomach contents was was trout and steelhead. Right. Which and I there thi- were about nine other things in front of it. Which I think is skewed because of where he kills those fish. Yeah, yeah. Because I've personally seen, you know, in low water back in when we had really low water in January, all these uh, salmon were, were mar- making their way down the river, heading out right to the ocean. There was... Literally, it looked like boulders were being thrown into the river. Just striper, just come. I mean, they're they're potting these hatchery salmon up to the surface and then coming in and ripping on them. Yeah. The birds were taking advantage of it. I mean, the, the striper were taking advantage of it. So, I don't know. I think that information's a little skewed. But yeah, by that, I mean, it's a sample size of yeah, one, yeah. right? But right. it's just it's an interesting totally. Thing. So we've done studies on the McCullamy, and our record is thirty six. So we've pulled thirty six smolts <laughs> out of a striper's belly. Well, How big was um, the striper? And it wasn't that big of a striper. Yeah. That's the scary part. Right. The, the um, it sounds like the smaller ones do most the of the damage. Was exactly. Like two, three, three inches. Yeah, they're about a couple inches yeah. long. And then you get things like the uh, pike minnow. And a pike minnow 
they just go into frenzy. So they a lot are. of times they're not just eating, they're just tearing fish up. Um, but the thing is, those are what I call predation hotspots or choke points. Because we'll sample fish there, like let's say below an outlet where all the fish are coming through. And, you know, uh, the stripers are just, they're just killing them. But you go down into some other part of the river where you don't have that kind of structure, and we do a stomach sample on those stripers, th they'll be more what you would expect in a native community. It'll be crayfish, there might be some bluegill. It, it won't mm -hmm. be primarily salmon. So part of it is trying to modify the habitat to make it less enticing for something, let's say, like a striper to hang out there. How do you do that? And eat fish. I, you look shallow, at it. Shallow it up is one thing. Okay. Hmm. Um, and then also if, like, in our case, if we're trying, if there's fish, juvenile fish that are going by and there's kind of a choke point for them, try and provide multiple outlets, multiple channels, whatever it may be. Hmm. And ideally is get people in there to fish for them. Right. And get them out. But that, you know, that can be difficult, particularly if you're talking about um, areas below dams or on private property. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It makes it more difficult. How do you contend with different stakeholders so there's municipal stakeholders there's conservation stakeholders there's farmers and you guys are right in the thick of all that so how do you how do you guys manage that i think one of the key things that we've done over the last you know 15 years is making folks understand that if you're getting let's say good runs of salmon if you're being successful in your outcomes as it regards to environmental issues your business needs and your ability to do business will be made much, much easier because of that. Um, it, it's, you know, our district, you know, back in the late 80s, used to be afraid of salmon issues, used to be afraid of natural resources. They'd rather not manage or deal with them. Having done it now for 20 plus years, they've recognized that it gives us the ability to do our business in a more efficient way. Um, not to get into details, but we recently, a few years ago, had to apply for a permit for operations of uh, Comanche Reservoir. With the successes we've had, that process went That's about as smooth yeah, as it could because be. Because trust was built because up. Because trust was built up. Transparency was there. Mm -hmm. We invited them early on, uh, them being the resource agencies. Take a look at it. Tell us if there's something you want to see, let us know, and we'll, and we'll try to do that. And it just made it that much easier. And it was a very smooth process. On the NGO side, it's inviting them to the NGO. I keep saying in NGOs, environmental groups. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Inviting them to the table. Um, that's one thing, again, that we've learned over time, that if folks are at the table, if they're heard, if we can interact with them and, and find a way to you know, achieve what they're looking for, it, it certainly helps out. And you know, we've had them provide us support on particular issues. Uh, we work closely with Golden Gate Salmon Association in dealing with some of the, you know, the hatchery issues and trying to improve, you know, funding and, and, and the ability to move fish. And they're a good group to work with, and they like working with us because we produce results. And, um, I mean, some of those results, I think I, I had spoke or I had noticed you earlier, is that what the contribution of the McCullery River salmon population is to the commercial and recreational fisheries out in the ocean. Last year... Uh, 2018, 43 percent of the commercial harvest came from McCullumy River fish, which right now it's not counted, right? Period. And throughout the valley, it's that those McCullumy salmon aren't counted towards that uh, that and that, that number, right? Yeah, and that's another that's a different thing. So I I'll, I'll can get to that one in a second. Okay. Yeah, because I'm confused. Yeah. So th this is basically of all those charters and all those commercial boats going out there and catching fish. Of the fish that they caught in 2018, on the commercial side, 43% of those were McCullough That's fish. huge. That's so big. Okay. That's crazy on, to on think the, about. On the <laughs> recreational side, 33% of those were McCullough fish. Now, one of the things is the enhancement program. Out of a river smaller than the feather. Out of a river that has about 2% of the total outflow of the delta. Um, part of that is the enhancement program is being run primarily out of the McCullough and starting this year will be run entirely out of the McCullough The enhancement program is the program that the salmon stamp folks pay for in part. And so they raise extra quote unquote enhancement fish 
that are used basically to enhance their fishery. Mm. Um, so Genetically enhanced? No, no. no, just no, no I'm, I'm messing around. <laughs> yeah, Franken fish bigger out fit, there. Bigger fans. No, no, no. Like just getting more fish. So these are the type of fish that are actually, in some cases, put into net pens out by Half Moon Bay, Santa Cruz, out by Fort Baker. So they're given the direct route out there. They're treated, you know, in a good way, put in a net pen, given a chance to acclimate and then release. So the expectation are that those fish are going to contribute, you know, two and a, he- two and a half years down the road to the fishery. To the commercial Commercial and recreational right. ocean fisheries. Right, right. Um, the thing you're talking about in terms of the Columbia doesn't count. So the the Sac Valley Index, which is what the fishing quotas are based on from the previous year, does not include the McCullumie returns as part of that calculation. Is this because it's not a federal or state project? It, it's you know I don't know what the history is. At one point it was a Central Valley Index. Mm-hmm. And then they went to Sac River, which is just the Sacramento and its tributaries, which doesn't include the McCullumy. And that's the way it is right now. But, you know, the issue with that is if the McCullumy is putting a lot of fish out there and a lot of the fish are coming back, um, but they're not being counted towards the management in terms of setting quotas, right. it, it may not work that well. Interesting. Yeah. It doesn't make a... It, that, that m- those numbers are mind-boggling, you know, to think about. I mean, 70% of the salmon are supposed to come from the feather, right? I think that's the number, right? Isn't it something like that? Yeah, I mean, should, there should probably be more fish coming from the feather and upper sack than the McCullamy. R- right. Yeah, so. so. What do you think needs to change? You, you were on the, that topic of working with these different agencies. What do you think needs to, to change as far as that goes? You know, I... I I think there needs to be, number one, more collaboration and openness to seeing new ways of doing things and and, and ideas. But I think the biggest issue is funding, again, and commitment to funding. On the McCullamy, we made that investment of $13 million. Again, it was because of an agreement, and we didn't do it out of the kindness of our heart 25 years ago. We probably would do that today if we had the funding need. But it's investing in these facilities. A lot of these facilities have been around since the dams were built um, in the 50s and 60s and haven't seen you know a whole lot of work done to them since then. Um, and then the other piece is looking at what you can do to improve water temperatures. Tem- water temperatures you know have a big impact on both the eggs and juvenile fish. You know at the McCullum we have chillers that we put in that um, chill the water, can knock it down, you know, 8 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, The American, I think, has just installed them over the last couple of years. I don't know what these other uh, systems have, so. You guys put uh, gravel and debris in those raceways too, right, to kind of help those fish create a habitat, basically, for them before they get out? Yeah, I mean, you you know, we so in 2008, when we had 412 fish come back, the staff at the hatchery had a lot of extra time to play with things. <laughs> so, so that's one of the things they did. You can't like having an 800 <laughs> room hotel and exactly, having 10 people exactly. show up all year. You, you can't yeah. raise 6.4 million fish in raceways like that. It's it just not going to work. Okay. Um, but it was more of an experiment, but it's something that's kind of shown that, you know, th- there's Thinking somewhere between exactly. And it's somewhere between just having a completely domesticated production that, your number one goal is produce fish at all costs to something like, you know, those enhanced raceways where they're really much, they're very much like the river system, but you can't raise that many fish. That sweet pot, sweet spot is somewhere in the middle. Hmm. Um, and those are the things when you talk about, you know, genetic management, uh, making sure, you know, you're trying to reduce things like inbreeding as best you can. Um, making sure that you know you're only using local stock when you can identify it and, and use it, um, so you, at least you're making some attempt to mimic natural selection. What was some other things? Releasing at night. Was releasing that, at night. Was that a, something different? Being that's something different that we tried to do. At least you do it at dusk or dawn mm-hmm. or dusk. Um, this goes down to predation. I yeah, trying to reduce not only fish predation but also avian birds. Birds. Yeah. yeah. I, and that's something we, we haven't and talked anglers. about much about is the bir- how much the birds have an impact on on those. Uh, yeah. What's the one in particular that uh, I'm thinking of? Cormorants yep. are the big one. Um, yeah. We, uh, As far as the McCullamy goes, we don't see too many issues with that. And I, I'm not quite familiar with California. I know up in Washington and Oregon, 
that's a huge deal. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, they'll go out to these cormorant roosting sites and actually look for the coat of art tags, and they're all over the place. You wow. know, in the crap. Right. right. <laughs> I've, uh, I, I've got another stakeholder question for you. Sure. If you have a salmon as one stakeholder and you have a farmer as another stakeholder, and water temperature is the key thing, um, and it's it's the root the root of the question is back to when you were talking about um, you've got that one reservoir that's that's got a pretty pretty harsh gradient and it's deep um, but you had to hold water back that one year during the drought so from a stakeholder perspective um, the farmers how do you guys deal with the farmers because they obviously need they that's the whole reason we have after bays and is to warm water up to release it for ag so how do you guys at, at the local level deal with that type of a stakeholder on our river system so most of the water goes primarily to either downstream for you know out to for a fish or also goes to municipal use for drinking okay, water so you don't have that issue so we do have ag ag users but they're primarily riparian so they they can take their water they have the riparian right or as i mentioned we have woodbridge irrigation district and they have a, a certain water right that they're entitled to and we deliver okay. it and so we don't have that that discussion are you going to get cold water are you going to get right. warm water and like we do especially like on the feather exactly right. yeah okay so keep that in mind when you guys are, you know, thinking about all the shit we could be doing on the feather. The the stakeholders that are on the system is a lot different than yep down down Definitely. on the colon. Well, one of the things I was going to talk about too, maybe I don't know if you know anything about this new system that is being. They're basically tracking what the predation is like down there in the San Joaquin, and they're using cameras and and a and a basically a, a mag. I, you probably know what I'm talking about. They basically hook a hatchery salmon onto this contraption. And they, they tell when and at what time and what pulled that thing off of off this system. I don't even know what the heck. You can probably talk more yeah. about well, it. But you know, they're basically tethered fish. They tether them to this, this unit, basically. They can mm -hmm. tell when there's been a predation hit. And I think it also has a camera that yep. goes off. So once that tether is pulled, um, it sets off the camera so they can see what it is. They used to have just tags that, let's say you had a salmon and you have it tagged. And it's swimming down, and all of a sudden you get a violent change of direction, and you can see the tag going a whole other direction upstream. That was w that was one way of actually, you know, uh, detecting predation. But mm -hmm. the, you know, technology just keeps on improving for mm -hmm. uh, monitoring fish. When I first started, you know, a fish tag was the size of a D cell battery, <laughs> and, and now they're getting them close to almost a grain of yeah. rice. I mean, it's incredible yeah. what they can do. Um, I know I I was talking about eugenics earlier and made a joke, but let's talk seriously about it for a minute. Um, have you? Is there any discussion around the role of genetic engineering when it comes to you know valley fish? No, no. In fact, I would say it's it's the opposite. It's the drive is to try and improve the natural components of the population. So from like, like a hatchery perspective, our goal is to reduce the number of hatchery fish that are spawning in the wild and hopefully improve our natural production. And at the same time, include some natural production in the hatchery uh, spawning. So you get some of that genetic material and some of that selection into the hatchery populations. So yeah, it, you know, and that's that thing. I mean, I think this group is probably pretty knowledgeable, but other folks that, you know, more lay people, you know, they, they see farm fish and they assume that these hatchery fish are those farm fish. And of course they're not. They're not farm. They spend about, you know, five months of their life in a hatchery and then the other two and a half years out in the ocean. So do you think that farm fish have a role in the food supply? That's a good question. Um, That's why I, I live in I live in California, and I don't have to worry about that because <laughs> usually we can get salmon either here or frozen from Alaska or wild. Well, okay, but so I, I think if it's done right and it's done in the right locations, I, I think it does play a role. I mean, because it is a a very healthy well, thing. And, and to also, have. I kind of feel like they're a necessary evil because as more and more say third world countries come on online to you know first world countries obviously their diet their 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 things that they're going to want are probably going to be you know western influenced salmon's a big part of our our diets so you know you can't sustain that kind of demand 
with current natural absolutely and i supply so you know the key thing is just like with the hatcheries is you want to make sure that you can separate that farm component from the yeah. natural or wild component and not have the two interact and that's the problem yeah. that happened up in canada exactly and prince the yeah. sound just, is there and that's why i they just kind of feel like that boat has left it's already left the harbor because if you're you know if, if you're ra- if if part of the part of the brood stock is is coming out of the hatchery right um some of them don't return their strain they're, they're gonna go what i'm trying to say is like over time that genetic stuff is gonna all blend together and i think that's your th- what you were saying about a valley steelheads a valley or a valley salmon's a valley salmon right a central valley fall run yeah. a central valley fall run but i think on that farm perspective though is th- yeah. those those stocks are bred very specifically for certain pen traits raised. and they're pen raised and they're typically they hold on to them for the whole time um, so one, if one of those gets out, which we've got to assume and, there's and some it, escape. And it happens. It has yeah. happened. Yeah. They've got, they've got, um, yeah, it's like evidence that, of it it's like Washington. that dog where the, the family goes up to Canada and they go camping and then they forget the dog. And then like five years later, the dog shows up at their doorstep. <laughs> you know? yeah. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. But, you know, luckily I think the breeding for those farm salmon is so focused on meat production yeah, uh, they don't do very well spawning. That's not to say that they can't right. or won't, but nature um, finds a way. You know, it's yeah. That sounds like a good podcast that we we need yeah, to we gotta bring into the future because that uh, process has been changed over the last few years, and it's yeah. getting. It seems like it's getting better and better. They're controlling the the waste that's underneath those pens. They're, I mean, they're doing a lot to try to make it better you know, right yeah it's like it, it's it. it's horse and buggy days for that industry and they they're it's getting better i'm you know i'm a proponent of it for the reasons already stated yeah but as long as you know the, the dna getting not getting out of the pins the main thing right but well, then when you go down south america now you have chinook salmon running in chile you have chinook salmon in uh, argentina and those are all escapees from the farm programs down there when they weren't done correctly so that's right. That's right. That's turned into a pretty big fishery. And it makes money for <laughs> guides down there. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, it's super interesting. Well, are we missing something, Jose, that we didn't we didn't talk about that you think is, is interesting or should we talk? I think that the Department of Fish and Game should open up some of these uh, spots below the dam and let us come in and get stripers. Do some stri- <laughs> striper I'll, fishing. I think I'll, I'll, like one you, I'll I let you make this. that case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or if you want to just pilot the program and have me and Nick come in there. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I just think, you know, again, one of the key things is just the monitoring. You know, on the McCullamy, we have a system set up where we have our spawning or um, up migration monitoring. We have spawning surveys. We have screw traps set up to do the juveniles. You know, we have all the science applied to get good estimates and also to um, make assessments in terms of changes we make and what the outcomes are in terms of fish. So I think, you know, that's the key in just making sure that that commitment is sustained and long term. Well, I, I think you have definitely been one of the keys to this whole program, you know, just calling you out a little bit. But is there somebody else that deserves some? Sure. I mean, Michelle Workman, who's run that office for, you know, about five years yeah something like that six years um as a supervisor she's done a tremendous job there but the whole team yeah. not only the team but also the shifting culture at the district that's, that's, that's what I was gonna that's um, a good part of it I because bet. you know operators you know if you look at the operators you know that operated the dams in the in the system back in the late 80s they probably didn't have stewardship <laughs> as one of their uh, primary uh thoughts going through their minds And, you know, as that program took off, some of them were, you know, resistive. And, you know, I completely understand that. But as we've worked with them, as we've, you know, tried to get them to understand is we're not here to say no. We're not here to tell you you can't do this. Let's find a way where we get mutual benefits out of it. And that cultural shift has been probably one of the neatest things I've seen working at the district since the kind of initial parts back in 92 to see that shift and now to see them being the proponents. You know, I go to an operating committee now, I don't have to be the one to be talking about temperature, dissolved oxygen. They know it, they got it. They're operating to make sure that we're, you know, we're being as optimal as we can. 
So that's that's been a huge part in the district yeah. and how and, it's changed. And, and also, I'm going to assume their comp plan was restructured over the last 20 years with these kind of metrics in mind. Oh, performance plan? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, things like meet, I, meeting I'm flow a standards. I'm a firm believer that people will be stewards if you put together the right incentives to Absolutely. make them stewards. Yep. Whatever those would be, whatever the psychology of that person is, right? Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and that is certainly part of their, you know, performance planning yeah. and, you know, the whole idea that water supply and fish come first, everything else comes second. Yeah. yeah I think it's pretty cool. I don't think we talked about it, but the, just the hatchery manager, he's got a, a house right on, on yeah. site, right? Yeah. I guess, and your folks may know this, but so the hatchery is actually operated by DFW, California Department of Fish and Wildlife, oh. paid for by East Bay Mud. And that's how all the hatcheries up and down the valley work. That's a feather. It's DFW that runs it, but it's uh, Department of Water Resources that pays, that for, pays it. for it. Right. Uh, American, it's the Bureau. American and Shasta are, are the Bureau. So, but you know, that's another thing that's changed. Is originally the or in the beginning, there was very little trust between the two organizations. But as we made our commitments and made our changes in operation, slowly but surely, they started to recognize that we were planning you know this was long term there was a commitment we want to do the right thing they started to work more closely with us and you know obviously the the outcome speaks for itself wow very cool chad do you want to add anything else to no I to this awesome great. podcast or i think it was awesome <laughs> <laughs> i just w i hope that uh, it, we can bypass a lot of the issues that and, and timing issues that we face and, and get right into to improving on our fisheries like right now and use McCollamy as a as an example I, I think it's just been fantastic and I, I hope that we can we can make a difference in some of these other places and take what you guys have done and just roll with it yeah you know I, I, I think the want is there right it's just a commitment right you know it's getting that commitment getting that transparency going and that um, that openness to just try things and do it without having a i guess a regulatory lever or tool to kind of force people to do it right um so well thank you very much for for giving us your time today we've we learned a ton and really appreciate it and i hope this story um uh, sinks into a lot of our listeners so yeah well thank you yeah. I, I enjoyed it and uh hope to see good things in the future yeah we might have to have you back to talk more about this because i think it's i think you guys aren't done i think there's more to come all right absolutely yeah and uh, after you guys hang up this uh or hang up stop this podcast make sure you get online and, and go to caltrout become a member or, or make a donation they're doing a lot for us out there and th do a lot more with your help now i just have to remember that I, we that did, you the did it yeah <laughs> you have to write this, this little, little note yeah <laughs> <laughs> thanks again jose appreciate yeah, it thanks for coming very on. welcome very thanks good. so much tight lines everybody